There was once a couple who lived in some northern state, like Maine. And uh, they decided to move to some southern state, like Alabama, to, for a business venture. And after a while, unfortunately, the business venture didn't, didn't quite work out. So the husband decides that he's going to move back north um, because you know he's from there and he's, he's going to get a job back in Maine. So he moves back to Maine. Uh, the wife, however, decides she doesn't, she doesn't really want to move and she really kind of likes it here and she's, she's going to stay here and make it work. And they had bought a house when they moved and they still owned their old house. So, you know, she stayed in the new house. He went back to Maine, stayed in the house in Maine, gets a job. And over the years, no one really changes anything. He stays in Maine and works and you know, has a job, has a life. And she stays in Alabama and gets to know people and, and lives in the house. And so, you know, several years later down the line, when they get a divorce, no one's really that surprised. Hello everyone, Dylan Schumacher, Citadel Defense, and in my Twitter feed the past couple days, uh, the conversation about national divorce has been, uh, has been trending recently because uh, MTG uh, from one of the Carolinas, South Carolina, North Carolina, I think it's South Carolina, uh, tweeted that it's time for a national divorce, which is encouraging. And lots of people, you know, flipped out and talked about how that's ridiculous and that's insane. And uh, I have been surprised at the number of people from the right who think that that's a bad idea. Now, maybe I shouldn't be too harsh on them because originally when I heard that idea, I scoffed at it and mocked it. And I've probably done that in a past video on this channel even. Uh, however, I have certainly come around uh, for quite a while now that I certainly believe that that is the only valid option left. And let's talk about why. Reason number one, much like my parable, we live in two different Americas already. And maybe even more than two, you could argue, and, and I would certainly be open to that. So let's look at guns as an example, because gun laws vary wildly in this country. Uh, we have a national gun law, right? It's the Second Amendment. The militia being necessary to the security of the free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But depending on where you are in America, that is interpreted quite differently. Right? So for example, I stand here wearing a pistol and if there were, if I were to simply cross a state borderline, I'm still in America, but I cross into other states, I would instantly become a felon, right? Because I'm not allowed to carry a pistol in those states. And then sweet irony, my conviction as a felon then invalidates my God-given right to carry a pistol in the state in which I reside. Simply by crossing a state line, I become a felon. It's not like a ticket. It's not like, oh, you know, we don't really like that here, so we're going to fine you a couple hundred dollars. It is years. A, a, a felony is uh, 10 years in jail, $100,000 fine, right? Like, it is years of my life that I would instantly have to give to the state and be in a prison because of something that I'm doing right now that is 1,000% legal and fully okay. Something I do every day in my life that's just fine, not a problem at all, all of a sudden becomes a felony. Something which has been guaranteed as a right from a national law level from the Constitution since the founding of the nation. Now, I look at that and I say that's two different countries. That's not the same country. Now you could argue, oh, of course it is. And uh, However, at the end of the day, look at the results. It's two different Americas. You, you can look at a bunch of different things with that, right? You can look at abortion laws, for example, right? There, half this country believes that uh, abortion is actual murder, like you're literally murdering a human being, and the other half calls it health care, okay? The, you look at the, the transgender and the LGBTQAIP stuff, and you start to get a picture that there are drastically different views. And if you live in New York City, you are living in a different America than if someone lives on the plains of Kansas, right? Those are completely different Americas. They have different presuppositions about what America is. They have different desires for where America should go. 
and they have a different understanding of how we should even get there. Complete, you look at the race relations stuff, another great example. Half of this country believes that white supremacy is the greatest threat to the nation. The other half has no idea what that is. Right? There, there is a complete disconnect in how we perceive reality and how we think about this nation. Point number two, those differences that we have are irreconcilable. Again, this is not something about like, we disagree on the corporate tax rate. Well, you know, I, th I think the corporate tax rate should be like 10.7% and well, it's a little much. I think it should be more like 8.3, right? This isn't a disagreement like that. This is a disagreement at the core foundation philosophical level that they cannot be reconciled. I believe that murdering babies in the womb is just that, murder. And I think we should treat it legally like murder across the board. There are other people, of course, who would say, oh, that's preposterous. It's health care. We're caring for women. It's about women's rights. There's no middle ground there. Show me the middle ground. Show me the compromise. Show me the unifying value that connects those two positions. Because it's certainly not like valuing human life, for instance, right? It, what is the connecting American core value that we're, we're both you know, committed to that we're able to work through that difference? There isn't one. And that goes for a variety of issues. Same thing with guns. I believe it's your human God-given right to be able to walk about armed as you please. There are other people who would, of course, call that terrorism and think that that's horrible. And how dare you don't, you don't have this, right? We need to care about public safety, right? There's no reconciliation there. What, what, what's the reconciliation? Oh, well, you know, just give us some of your guns. Well, we're, we're just going to pass these laws and you can't carry it in these places. Well, you know, we're just going to have to register your guns. Like, th there's no middle ground or compromise in that position. Same thing goes with the transgenderism and the, and the LK, LGBTQIAP thing, right? It, it's, oh, well, you know, we're only going to mutilate some little boys and girls parts and, and we'll leave some other ones alone. Like, what, what's the middle ground there? The differences that we have are both cultural and philosophical, and they run to the very core of what we believe about humanity, about morality, and about what America is and should be. There's no reconciling those differences. No matter what side of the fence you're on in that, you have to realize there's no reconciling. There's no way to talk through that. There's no way to come to a place of agreement because none of us value the same thing. There was a time in this country when, of course, we, we did believe in core values, right? The people who created this nation had a common belief in core values. Not that they didn't argue and fight, right? Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were famously friends, then not friends for a very long time and then reconciled at the end of their lives. And they both, uh, Penn helped create the constitution, they both helped start the revolution, they both led the nation through it, they were both president. Like they, they both cared deeply about America and liberty. However, they, they, had, they had differences that they debated on and how they thought it should be done exactly. But at the end of the day, they had some core values that they shared. You show me the last president who shared core values with the last president before him, and I'll show you a unified nation. We haven't had that, at least my entire adult lifetime, probably longer. This is not something that is just brand new. It feels like, you know, oh, it's, this just happened. How are we so divided all of a sudden? But the truth is that we have been at this and slowly building that division as a nation for decades. For decades, this nation has been growing apart and growing into two different Americas. And so one day you wake up and, and you wonder why mom and dad don't love each other anymore. The divorce, if you want to call it that, and a lot of people will equate that right with civil war. Well, that's what he means. That's not what I mean. I, I don't think those are necessarily the same thing. They don't, certainly don't have to be. Uh, the, the divorce is coming, whether you want it to or not. Uh, we are definitely past the point of no return for this nation. Because even if all of these cultural issues don't boil over between the people, at this point, the federal government is so bloated and so incompetent that it is going to collapse under its own weight. And like we have seen in history hundreds of times before, a government will no longer be able to do the things that it says it should be able to do, and it will just crumple, and the people will be left to pick up the pieces. This has happened with countless empires throughout history, and we're just another example, and it's really that simple.
So to me, the question is not like if, the question is just when. The federal government is so fat and grotesque and lacks so much competence, it will no longer be able to sustain itself to exercise the authority and power that it once enjoyed. So the only question in my mind really becomes not when, but how bad is it going to be when it happens? Point number four, and, and don't get me wrong here, I am under zero illusion uh, that the communists would ever be willing to come to the table and say, well, let's, let's just divide up this fairly and evenly, right? This, this, won't, this won't happen. Uh, that, that's not going to be a thing that would happen. All as much as I would, I would like it to happen, I do not believe that the communists could ever let something go. Their religion demands that you comply. So for them to let you go is it, it, counter to their religion. They, they can't do it. There's a reason they had to build the Iron Curtain, right? There's a reason they had to build the Berlin Wall. They can't let people leave. Because if they let people leave, it doesn't work. Right? They have to demand your compliance. They have to demand your acceptance. That's what the entire religion is built on. So I'm under no illusions that we could you know, come to the table and we could just agree. I would love for that to happen, but of course the communists could never let that happen. So again, I think that's why we'll get there because of the collapse of, of the federal government power and their authority rather than because of any mutual agreement we happen to reach. Point number five. Uh, there's just a severe lack of trust in the government. Uh, again, roughly half the nation believes that voting doesn't actually mean anything anymore. We've lost faith in our elections, which was our central mechanism for self-governance. So if at least half of the nation has zero faith and, and getting into the negative faith in government and the institutions that we once put our trust and faith in, well, then again, well, where can that go? And this is one of the reasons I, I think libertarians just completely miss. They completely uh, dismiss uh, cultural factors or problems like, again, guns, abortion, trans stuff. They, they completely dismiss all those factors, which is a huge mistake. And then they say, oh, listen, if, if we just reduce the size of the federal government, you know, then, then we could actually do federalism. Like we could go, we could go back, and you know, the states could kind of be different. And that'd be good, but we'd be governed by the same federal law, and you know, we could like turn the clock back. I can't think of one his, one empire in history that's ever been able to successfully turn the clock back. I can't think of one. If you can think of one, I, honestly, please tell me. But I cannot think of a single empire in the history of the world that has been able to turn the clock back. We've reached a point, or again, we no longer value the things we value. And because we've lost that faith in the government, people like me, for instance, will have no uh, interest in pursue or putting my faith back in the government as long as I live ever again. You can't turn that clock back. You can't restore faith in governing institutions after it has been so thoroughly stomped underfoot, lit on fire, and then sent into a pit of venomous snakes. That faith isn't coming back, no matter what you do to reduce the size of the federal government, which, by the way, is a near impossibility at this stage in the game. This isn't something that's unique in human history by any stretch. Let's look at some old maps of Europe to kind of give you an understanding that this is just how history goes. You don't necessarily need to be uh, emotional about it, although there's plenty of reasons to, but let's just understand that this is a normal part of human history since we've left the garden. So here's a map of Europe in 300 BC. Okay, as you can see, the Celts uh, dominate massive parts of Europe. Uh, we got into Fran France and into Germany there. The Celts were a massive culture. They eventually reached down to Turkey. Like you have some massive, massive cultural sweep there. That little small red part, if you can even read that in the middle of Italy there, that's Rome. That's the Roman Republic. Carthage is still a state. Half of you are like, what's Carthage? The kingdom of Macedon is doing very well around this time. And then, you, of course, you have the Seleucid Empire, which is another Greek empire after Alexander the Great died over there in Turkey. Now, let's fast forward a little bit. Now, here we have a map of around 100 AD, give or take. Everything that's pink is the Roman Empire. It has massively expanded in about 400 years and completely erased all of those different 
countries, if you can call them that, tribes, cultures, they no longer exist. There is only Rome. And at this point, it stretches from Spain to Turkey and covers almost everything in between. And the glory of Rome here is somewhat near its height. Rome will eventually reach all the way down into like Baghdad for a couple years. Uh, But Rome has more or less gobbled up everything in its sight. And at that point, if you're living in 100 AD, you would think Rome is eternal. It's the eternal city. It's never going to leave. Now, you fast forward another 375 years, and here you have Europe again at the fall of the Roman Empire. And all of a sudden, the power of the Rome seems so small and abysmal by comparison. The Eastern Roman Empire has hung on a little bit there in Turkey and Greece. Europe is a completely different place. You have the Visigoths and the Vandals now owned down into Carthage. You have the kingdom of Odysseur in Italy. can't even pronounce that. And a million other kingdoms that have been carved up out of the corpse of the Roman Empire. What once seemed eternal is now suddenly off the map. Fast forward again about another 500 years here to around 1000 AD. And all of a sudden again, Europe is a completely different unrecognizable place. The Eastern Roman Empire, to their credit, is still hanging on there in Turkey. You have the Holy Roman Empire, which is really just a Germanic state who claims the title because they think it's cool, uh, dominating the middle. You have the Kingdom of the Franks, which are Germanic people in France, which is what it gets its name from. Some countries are starting to recognize that kind of sort of are around in the modern day, like, like the Kingdom of England. You have the Kingdom of Alba up in Scotland and a bunch of other little kingdoms in Ireland. The Duchy of Poland, you'll see, exists, and so does the Principality of Hungary. And you start to see, oh, I kind of recognize some of those places. Like, okay, this is starting to look quote-unquote normal. Additionally, you look at this map of 1000 AD, and you see that Spain and all of Africa has been conquered by Muslim tribes that have moved through and conquered almost all of Spain and the, the entire top of Africa. You fast forward to 1500 AD, which is another about 500 years. And okay, the the Holy Roman Empire is kind of still a thing. And and England and Scotland and Ireland have kind of solidified a little bit. Hungary's still there. Poland's still there. Lithuania has appeared out of nowhere. That's cool. The Ottoman Empire has arisen to crush the Eastern Roman Empire. And that no longer exists. Russia's kind of on the map now. And Spain and Portugal, okay, you know, it's starting to look look normal here. You fast forward to 1914, almost just uh, over a hundred years ago, and it's a completely different place yet again. The Austria-Hungary Empire is at its, I don't know about its peak, but it's certainly about to die. It doesn't make it out of World War I. Neither does the Ottoman Empire. Those don't survive World War I either. Africa at the bottom there is carved up into a bunch of different colonies. Here's a map from 1942. At the height of German power in the middle of World War II, look at Germany. It is completely gobbled up. Almost everything to its east and its west. It's crushed Norway. Really, Sweden should even be part of Germany there because Sweden just completely capitulated and did whatever the Nazis wanted. So you see here that, again, the entire world looks different. Imagine living in France in 1942 when Germany has rolled through and completely routed your entire army. You've got to be thinking, this is just life now. This is it. There's, there's no going back from this. Like, look at the might of the German army to have completely and utterly annihilated our entire existence. There, 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 this is it. This is where we live now, forever. Four short years later, in 1946, the world again looks completely different. France has been restored. Germany has been carved up into the east and west and a bunch of different places. Poland and Lithuania have been completely absorbed and gone into the Soviet Union, along with Romania and Ukraine. Those aren't places. They're just part of the Soviet Union at that point. So I hope that wasn't too annoying, but when you look at these maps over time, you start to realize that nations rise and nations fall And that is the way of human history. And yes, of course, no one wants to live through the fall of an empire or the fall of a nation. No, but that's not exciting for anybody. 
but it's nothing new and it's nothing unique to the human experience. And don't think that you're somehow going to escape the fate. America won't last forever. One way or another, it won't happen. And it might just be, unfortunately, a problem you have to deal with in your lifetime. My last point here, point number seven, I think is one I'm on, is that what's the alternative? <laughs> I think people who think of a national divorce or something like that, think of that as the worst possible outcome that could possibly happen. But I would say, what, what's really the alternative to that? Is, is it to live under tyranny, some of the worst tyranny uh, America's ever experienced, ever in its history? indefinitely is it is it to hand your children into a despotism and to be slaves to some future tyrant who will continue to take more and more from them while crushing them into unending poverty what what's the alternative to a national divorce at what cost should we stay as one country what are you willing to pay in order for that to happen i don't think a national divorce is the worst thing that could ever happen I don't think that carving America up into separate nations who get to live more the way they want and in line with their values is, is the worst possible thing that could happen. I think the worst possible thing that could happen is for my children and their children to live under despotism and unending poverty forever. I think that's far worse than the United States not being the United States anymore. There are some objections you know, that you commonly hear like, well, it'll, it'll reduce our standing in the international world, to which I would say, yeah, it will. But our standing in the international world is tanking and will continue to tank the rest of our life no matter what. That, that ship has sailed. Again, the federal government's passed the point of no return. It's going to crush itself under its own grotesque weight. And so our standing is going to plummet no matter what. People could say it won't work, you know, it, people died to keep America together, we gotta, we gotta make this work. And I would say it's not working now. And their blood will have been spilt in vain when the country turns to complete tyranny anyway. So I, I don't really, I understand the desire to want to keep the nation together, right? E pluberis unum, I probably mispronounced that and butchered that, but out of many, one, right? That, that, that's the dream of America. We have many states united into one. And I get that. I think that's an amazing dream. However, we have to live in line with reality. And reality is the nation is so divided among so many irreconcilable differences that the best, most peaceful resolution we could ever hope for would be that we would just decide to peacefully part ways. Do brave deeds and endure.